Hello everyone and welcome to Creation.Live. I'm Dr. Brian Thomas. In each episode of this show, Institute for Creation Research scientists will gather with subject matter experts, apologists, and other special guests to discuss pressing issues, whether that be current research at ICR here, new information that has come to light in the scientific community, or something else entirely that impacts how science ultimately points to our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever the topic, we hope these conversations are encouraging and enlightening in an increasingly chaotic world. Today I have with me some ICR scientists. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Jeff Tompkins, expertise in genetics on my left. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. He's great doing to be great. Here. And then we have new to the program here, Dr. Tim Cleary, uh, geologist. How are you today? I'm doing great. Yay. And then uh, again, Weathering every storm, our president, Dr. Galuza, uh, welcome to this third episode where we're talking about natural selection and we're letting the, the selectionists speak about it themselves. Well, in the first episode, we looked at some quotes from um, what we're now starting to call selectionists um, and what they said about natural selection, their own beloved theory, is that... Um, Wow, we recognize after thinking about this that Darwin flipped the script. And in the first episode, we talked about how he, he sort of made a mental shift from thinking about creature, um, creature's adaptations in, less in terms of the creature itself and its internal mechanisms, uh, uh, i.e. its designed mechanisms. And he flipped it to where now we think about uh, the environment, the, the, the outside world, as having this creative ability that sort of crafts and, and molds creatures as though they're passive modeling clay. But, but, it's the, but it's some of these evolutionary thinkers themselves who recognize that Darwin did this and they're looking at it going, that's just a shift from internalism to externalism. That's one of the several topics that we talked about. But what it does for us is it, it, it causes us to rethink natural selection. And so it's like a little red flag going up, wait a minute, is this really science? Or is just this some sort of a, a mental construct? And every question we ask, and we've been probing natural selection from all these different angles. Last episode, for example, we, we talked about selective pressures. And what are the selectionists saying about selective pressures? And they're saying, well, it, it's, it, it could mean anything. It could mean whatever you want it to mean. We talked also about um, um, what is nature actually selecting? And one guy says it's selecting uh, the individual, another guy says it's selecting the gene, another guy says it's selecting environments. I mean, it's, it's like you just throw in whatever you want. And it's, it, so, it's, so the more we look at this phrase, the more we see it as an empty analogy. I'm starting to think that it doesn't even rise to the level of testable science. It's just sort of a, a construct. So we're going we're gonna to spend this episode thinking along these lines and asking even more probing questions about natural selection, and letting the opposition do the work for us. They're the ones who have, um, who have critiqued their own beloved theory. And so our job isn't that tough today. It's just to let, you know, it's just to listen to what they're saying about their theory as they're thinking about it. So that's kind of where we're headed with our first, um, our first question today being something along the lines of this metaphor idea, metaphor. So, Dr. Galuza, you study this a lot, and maybe you can tee this up for us. Um, where does the metaphor come in? I mean, isn't natural selection obvious? Isn't it when I go and, and out in the world and I see a hawk eat a, um, um, a mouse? Well, that, that mouse just got deselected, and all the mice that didn't get eaten, they got selected, right? I mean, isn't it just plainly obvious? Where does the metaphor even come in on this? Yeah, you would almost think that that would be plainly obvious, that there's a... Some creatures which are able to fit in certain environments and they have the traits that fit there and other creatures don't. And that's why it's really important about this interpretive framework. And the metaphor goes back to the word that you already used already and that's the analogy that Darwin used which as we discussed in the last episode was really a patently flawed analogy. And so the metaphor is the idea that nature acts like a human breeder or a human selector. And Darwin made this analogy right from the very beginning. He looked at uh, pigeon fanciers or pigeon breeders, and he saw how they could select for various traits, and they got a huge variety of pigeons in a very short time. And he said, aha, maybe 
maybe, maybe nature's just like that pigeon selector. Maybe, maybe nature can select for these traits one or the other. And over a, an immensely long period of time, instead of just getting varieties of pigeons, maybe you can get something completely different than a pigeon. And the metaphor actually takes on more life because he ends up personifying nature, where Darwin actually looked at natural selection more than just a constructive agent. He looked at it as an omnipresent, omniscient, creative force where he says natural selection, and this is a quote, is incessantly scrutinizing every, essentially every trait on every creature all the time, carefully and unfailingly selecting the best and basically eliminating the rest. And so he has this metaphor of the selector, which he used over and over again. And, you know, we really can't dismiss Darwin very lightly because he was a very thoughtful man. Not only was this metaphor absolutely essential of the selector, but he rolled in another idea to give direction to his theory, which was Malthus, that in any one generation there are more offspring bo uh, born at any one time than resources available for, available for him. So the offspring have to compete amongst each other, of which there can be one survivor who is the best or the fittest by definition, and then they go on to reproduce, and then their offspring compete, of which the best emerges, and then over time, you end up with the best of the best of the best, and you end up with humans in that case. And so the metaphor of a selector rolling in, this whole idea of competition, driving it in one direction, and the, as you already mentioned, the environment working on and crafting organisms, these are unique Darwinisms. Nobody was thinking about them before Darwin. Nobody was applying selective abilities to nature before Darwin. They had the idea that about the mouse and the hawk that you just mentioned, but nobody was applying these uniquely Darwinian uh, ideas to get a comprehensive theory, which is why we're talking about Darwin today and not uh, other people. Well, the other reason we're talking about Darwin today is because his followers find new flaws in that original thinking. And uh, so of the four of us in the discussion today, uh, Dr. Tompkins is the one who has hands-on experience as a breeder. And so will you re reiterate for us, what were some of the processes that you went through when you actually did selecting? And sort of describe that for us, when, what, what you did and sort of how, how it worked. Well, sure, I was involved in plant breeding. It was for agricultural purposes. It was soybean breeding uh, specifically, but it was more than just selecting. We would control the matings or the crosses. We would choose this parent to mate with this other parent. Um, and then we have very specialized systems of growing out progeny and so that we could eventually down the, down the line make uh, very specific selections, which we did uh, for yield and for pest resistance and all sorts of things. So it was a very complex process and you had to, to essentially have a PhD in plant breeding and genetics to successfully do that. And so, um, you know, for Darwin to, to take what animal and plant breeders do uh, and apply that to nature is, it's absurd. Mm. And it's, it's absurd in your view because in your experience, you. Like you said, you, you, you have to be smart and capable. You have to be smart and capable, well, but sure. nature, nature doesn't have that. Ex exactly, nature has no mind. It doesn't do things um, you know, with wisdom or intention. There is no purpose uh, in nature, but yet Darwin projected that onto nature. Um, and of course, the quotes we gave in that, that previous episode you know, illustrated that, and the quote that uh, Dr. Guglielmo referred to uh, as well. Right, right. Well, this, this projection onto nature of what only breeders can actually do, um, for some reason, it has been successful in its seductiveness. And so that's why all of us were raised thinking that natural selection, okay, it's obvious. Somehow it seduced even us um, who, you know. In other words, even after we came to doubt Darwinism on the whole, um, we still were thinking selection can, can do something at least, um, but were we seduced and have, have Darwinists themselves admitted 
that this has been a seductive concept, and that's where our first set of quotes helps us to answer that question. Um, so the first one is John Rees in his book, Not By Design. Um, he says, in 1866, seven years after the publication of On the Origin of Species, Alfred Russell Wallace wrote to Charles Darwin proposing that Darwin eliminate the term natural selection from his work. His grounds were that natural selection, and now he's quoting from Wallace, natural selection is a metaphorical expression of it and to a certain degree indirect and incorrect since even personifying nature, she does not so much select. So here we have, even right then at the, at the origin of the origin <laughs> of species, uh, right then uh, w within a few years, people were reading, lots of people were reading Darwin's book and they were saying, look, nature's not, this is just a, it's, a, it's an incorrect metaphor. That's what he's saying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people saw the flaw in Darwin's thinking and his use of language right off the bat. And in fact, I want to uh, read from uh, an article, a section of an article that Andrew Moore wrote in 2011, and this is in the journal Bioessays. You know, I think it's, it's very telling that the title of his article is, We Need a New Language for Evolution. And he said this, he said, I believe that a large part of our difficulty in avoiding the invocation of agency, which was natural selection and direction in evolutionary processes is our persistent inability to define natural selection in terms of physical laws and processes. In the meantime, anthropomorphic terminology in evolution might persist just because scientists like using it. But it is one of the worst things that we can do. Given widespread public misunderstanding of the fundamental principles of evolution, and I bet that it even leads scientists themselves astray sometimes. And this quote is, is so true because when I read articles in my field, which is genetics and genomics uh, and cellular biology, people use that metaphor of natural selection as if it's some sort of a real agent or a mystical agent, so to speak. Um, I see it all the time in, in modern articles and, and have in my career for the past you know, 30 years. Uh, I see that usage. And so I can understand why Andrew Moore is, is making this, this statement that uh, he's speaking to his fellow evolutionists. You know, we need a, a new language for evolution that really represents uh, reality. What's really going on in the creatures? Exactly. As they, right. as they, as they and he's not a creationist by any means. But right. He, he's recognizing the problems in this, in this lingo that's that's thrown around in the journal papers and the textbooks. So someone help me out. He uses this giant word, anthropomorphic terminology. I, am I right in understanding that anthropomorphism is attributing personhood? to non-persons. Well, exactly, and we get that word from anthropos, which is, means, in Greek, it means humans or humankind. So, so when I say, or when someone says, um, selection pressures must have forced uh, this color of plumage onto this, this bird, I just used an anthropomorphism? Exactly. In because other words, because you're, gave, you're using something that, <laughs> that we can only apply to humans, agency um, and intelligence. And of course, that's, it's utter nonsense when applying that to nature. Mm. Interesting. Exactly. And that's what, that's what Andrew Moore is saying. You know, we need to, we need to use lingo or, or terminology that accurately reflects what's going on. Well, Dr. Uh, Clary, you've got a quote here from... Richard, Richard Lewontin. Richard Lewontin said this about the metaphors. He said, nothing creates more misunderstanding of the results of scientific research than scientists' use of metaphors. It is not only the general public that they confuse, but their own understanding of nature that is led astray. The most famous and influential example is Darwin's invention of the term natural selection, which he wrote in On the Origin of Species. 
Okay, so now you're going to quote from Darwin. I'm going to quote from Darwin. So it's a quote within a quote. Darwin said this, is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good. And Richard Lewontin goes on to say, unfortunately, even modern evolutionary biologists, as well as theorists of human social and psychological phenomena, who have used organic evolution as a model for general theories of their own subjects, are not always conscious of the dangers of the metaphor. Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-inventor of our understanding of evolution, wrote to Darwin in July 1866, warning him that even intelligent persons were taking the metaphor literally. So here we see he was, again, the reminder that people right off the bat recognized that this, something about this is just not right. That the, we're using this metaphor, but we haven't defined it. And, and in geology, I was going to piggyback on what some of Dr. Galuzzo said earlier, Darwin thought, thought these changes could take place over great amounts of time. And in geology, you know, we kind of, the early geologists in the 19th century were starting to add in millions of years at this time. So Darwin just kind of fed off what the geologists were saying. He said, we need this big pillar of deep time that anything can happen, that nature can cause these things to happen, as he kind of envisioned it, to make these changes, and nature can select, as was Darwin was saying. Yeah. But we see that nature can't select anything. A, a mindless environment can't select anything at all. Yeah, it really isn't. <clears throat> but he hid it behind that shroud of deep time. You know, he kind yeah. of said, well, anything can happen. And that's what we're taught as geology students. We're taught natural selection, survival of the fittest, that's what gave us the fossil record. But we really see no evidence that anything ever changed from one to the other. We just see new things showing up in the fossil record. Fully formed. Fully formed yeah. and ready to go right. you know, and doing their thing. Exactly. And then they disappear. And then, you know, and we realize as creationists that that's the record of the flood. Yeah, there's a lot of shrouding. And Dr. Thomas mentioned in the prior episode that Darwin, you know, he cleverly hid agency in an unexamined analogy. And that was very good. It's, it's a very clever thing that Darwin did here. <clears throat> and then when you throw in really what are incomprehensible periods of time, even a million years is incomprehensible. It allows a lot of things to be shrouded mm -hmm. in absolute mystery. And, and there's a lot of sleight of hand going on here. And, and you know, um, when Andrew Moore is talking about this and he wants to get rid of the anthropomorphic language, he really does not want evolutionary theory to be uh, clouded in mysticism and magic. He, he really wants to get away from anything that might smack of any agency, mystical agency whatsoever, and, to, and turn it in basically in a, into a totally secularized, naturalistic view. So for true atheists, Darwin was not atheistic enough. They like to take their atheism straight, and they're like, they like it pure. And Darwin just mixed in another type of agent here. And Stephen Talbot, he's a member of the Third Way, who, is, who are really kind of doubting. Not, I don't know if they would doubt everything about evolutionary theory by any means, but they certainly doubt the efficacy of natural selection. And some of them, like Talbot here, are even doubting the, the concept altogether, where he points out by saying, evolutionary biologists routinely speak of natural selection as if it were an agent. And that's what Dr. Tompkins was talking about when he reads it over and over in his papers. He goes on to say, many evolutionary biologists, in fact, assure us that the idea of a selecting agent is only a metaphor. In other words, when you call them on the carpet, well, well, we're not really using it like an agent. It's just a, it's just a metaphor. And, but then he adds, even as they themselves succumb to the compelling force of the metaphor. And I would say that happens to evolutionary scientists, it even happens to us creationists as well too. And then he adds, are, and so, are we to believe that natural selection is, quote, not an agent except metaphorically, and manages design artifacts and the organism, and the organism is not, after all, a creative originating agent itself. It, speaking of the organism's agency, has been transferred to an abstraction, speaking of natural selection, whose causal agency or force is, amid intellectual confusion, both denied and universally implied by biologists. Natural selection becomes rather like an occult power of the pre-scientific age. You know, that's, a, that's kind of a, a little convoluted, but he's, he's trying to point out, on the one hand, they say this, 
but on the other hand, they say that. And he's going back and forth, back and forth by showing they deny it's a metaphor, but then they use it as a metaphor. They deny the organism's agency and they project it onto this abstraction. And all the while, they seem to be succumbing to its own seductive powers. Wow, this is, this is revealing. And this, this particular quote uh, by Talbot, he's, he's really got to be thinking about what he's reading in the literature. And when we read quotes like this, where we're thinking, okay, here's an evolutionary scientist who is saying, my colleagues treat natural selection as though it's a metaphor when they're called on it. Well, what's really doing the change in the creature? Well, natural selection. Well, what's really, what's, what's, what is nature really selecting? What's really happening with that? Well, it's just actually a metaphor. But then the next question, metaphor for what? What's actually happening? And it turns out it's just, it's just, It's all smoke it's and vacuum, mirrors. It's smoke and mirrors. And that's what we're, that's what we're getting at. And that's what they seem to be getting at, at, at least with some of these well, Darwin admissions. invented this, this use of the, the metaphor, if you want to say that, by personifying nature and what it's doing. But, but really, if they don't use that, they have nothing else to, <laughs> to really back it up because there's no real science out there to support natural selection. And we talked about this in uh, the, one of the last sessions we did, that uh, there's many scientists out there who, who openly say there is no evidence for natural selection. There's no scientific study that really proves it. And we talked about Michael Lynch, and he actually did genomic studies uh, to prove that, that natural selection was not really operating on, on systems where it should have been. And, and other scientists have admitted that as well. Eugene Koonin uh, is another example of a famous scientist. So, so scientists out there realize there is really no hard science behind the metaphor. And so I think that's why a lot of scientists use it because it's, it's just a convenient way to, to say something with, with, without having any, any evidence to really yeah. back it up. I think, the, I think the solution to this, and Talbot kind of hits on it here in his, his quote, and it's been, it's been alluded to in other quotes by Jerry Fodor or, or originally, or earlier in some of our discussions, is he says the, the agents, agency has been transferred. So where we need to, when Dr. Thomas is saying, well, what's behind this metaphor? What's behind it? The answer is we're looking in the wrong place. You need to go to the organism. And that's where the, that's where the mechanisms and the systems are, which are really solving the problem of the hawk. You know, when, when, when an organism can change from its fur from brown to white in the wintertime, it's really solving the problem of the hawk. It's, it's working to solve those solutions, and we then need to look in the organism. How does that happen? Why does it happen? Does it happen consistently all the same time? Are they detecting environmental cues? Does it happen on the same day every spring? Or can they adjust the time that they change back from white to brown and all those things? That's where we need to be looking for where these adaptive abilities really are. But, but natural selection, if that's how, if we want to project agency onto the environment, the externalistic view that natural selection presents and, the, and that Darwin persuaded us all of, then we won't, we won't even have the brain, we won't even have the frame of mind to even look inside the creature because we're, oh, we're just looking at the hawks. Right. All day long we're looking at the hawks. All career long, a scientist might be looking at the hawk, so, or, or whatever, predator, because we are conditioned out of the box to think in terms of the environment, the external, and that's what crafts the creature. And, and so it's almost like when we, of course, we read that study about the, um, the Arctic hare, right, that, she, that they, and biologists almost accidentally had to discover that the Arctic hare shifted, it, it, you know, because every, every winter it dons white plumage so it'll fit in with the snowy background. And then in the spring, brown plumage comes back in. So it transitions from brown to white every year. Uh, and then one year, the snows came early. The temperatures were lower consistently. And it turns out that the hares, just all, all of them, not the, not the selected ones, not the deselected ones, not the eaten ones, not the non-eaten ones, all of them deployed their white hair earlier that year because they have thermometers <laughs> and they're doing it on the, and so it's like when the biologists discovered that, it was kind of like, I, 
what's going on? It's like I've been looking in the wrong place this whole time. And so I, I, really, I really appreciate you sort of turning, you know, that's the, that's the next question, isn't it? Like where, if creatures are shifting and adjusting, and if it's not nature, where is it? Well, let's look inside the creature. But in order to do that, it's only one step removed from the one elephant in the room that atheists don't want in that room. That's the, the creator. The creator. And so that's... Well, that, that's kind of where the reason why I think they, they refuse to even look at the organism. They look externally, like externally, ever since Darwin put that out there, he made it. The external environment is causing the selection, causing the change, causing these organisms to go all the way up to humans, like as you mentioned. It's, it's all about the environment causing this and the force, but they can't quantify it. You know, they don't know if it's a force or a pressure or what it is, but they keep it all very elusive and all metaphorical. And so it doesn't really, there's, they just can use it whatever they want, like a black box. And, it's, and, it, and it's, in geology, they do the same thing with deep time. Mm. They just hide behind that shroud of deep time. Biologists hide behind the shroud of, well, external pressures from the environment can cause this to happen. And, and it just things. boils down to faith. Yeah, faith. but they, they <laughs> refuse the to realize that you know it's the internal organism that's been designed mm. by our Creator to, to sense the environmental changes and then to react and, and alter itself, not the environment causing the alteration. Yeah. Well, we 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 kind of veered off our first question, but that's great because this is a, a good uh, good feedback, guys. But so is it seductive? Somehow it's very seductive. Mm -hmm. And, and especially for someone who doesn't want the accountability to a creator in our, in our life. And Jesus, the Lord, said that, didn't he, in John 3? For men loved darkness rather than light because the evidence against God is overwhelming. <laughs> no, he said, because their deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. And so we have a world full of people who have evil deeds, and we love darkness rather than light, and we want to push the creator out. And what better way to do that than to sweep the strong evidence for a creator mm -hmm. through that which he has made, Romans 1, under this rug of natural selection and under this rug of deep time. And, and it turns out to be a metaphor and then it turns out to be an empty metaphor, but somehow it's seductive. Maybe some of that seductiveness comes from how it appeals to what the Lord Jesus talked about, how we love darkness rather than light. Well, well even a lot of Christians get sucked into this. You know, I, I just... Kind of like, you know, you hear geology when I was in my classes, natural selection, this and that. You think, yeah, that's, God used these external pressures to, to cause changes throughout, you know, the time of the earth, even though I didn't believe the earth was millions and billions of years old. You still kind of just, yeah, you just kind of go along with it. And, I, you know, I had to admit that I was wrong. Mm. First time I had a conversation with Dr. Randy here several years ago over lunch, I'm like, oh, yeah, it makes sense that the organism, mm. the, the things that God created, are actually what's changing in reaction to the environmental differences. If it's colder, they're going to get the white hair. If it's, you know, that's the whole idea. It's not the if they have the sensors for that. that, right? They have to have the sensors and right. then the output to, to to show you know the changes to grow more hair or to less hair to get bigger or smaller. All these things are happening internally. Like with like with the dark. Arctic hair mm -hmm. happening internally, and with the Arctic hair, you didn't have to have massive die-offs mm -hmm. that, one, that one season. You just had to have internal sensors, logic mechanisms, mm -hmm. and an appropriate response. That's all. You, you don't have to have massive die-offs. But Darwin wove die-offs or, or death into his, into his um, what did you call it, Dr. Galuza? His, his, his whole model? Yeah, his whole model, really. It's, it's his real whole theory, his explanatory theory okay. for adaptation. And the design of life and the diversity of life and all of those things. What role does death play? Because some are out there saying you don't need death, natural selection doesn't need, doesn't need death. Well, in Darwin's original conception, let's, let's look at that. And so, in fact, let's, let's quote from Darwin in his book on the origin of species. He said, this is the doctrine of Malthus. So, pause. Malthus, Thomas Malthus w was a philosopher with a unique idea that Darwin loved and held on to. And, Anyway, we talked about that in episode one, so rewind and, and listen to that episode to, to get some uh, idea of Malthusian philosophy. Um, anyway, so this doctrine of Malthus, where you've got lots of death, of death and death of the unfit, applied to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms. As many more individuals of each species are born than can possibly survive, and as consequently there is 
a frequently recurring struggle for existence. We shall see then how natural selection, um, I like how he capitalizes his own yeah. term, <laughs> <laughs> emphasizing his own genius. Anyways, uh, we shall see then how natural selection almost inevitably causes much extinction of the less improved forms of life. I don't think there are less improved forms of life. I think he's imagining that too. Uh, I have called this principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection in order to mark its relation to man's power of selection, uh, which we talked about in the last episode. There is no relation to man's power of selection because man has the power to select and nature doesn't. But the expression often used by Mr. Herbert Spencer of the survival of the fittest uh, is accurate. But the point here, doctrine of Malthus, applied to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms, many more individuals um, die, basically, than, can, than survive to the next generation. So here he is, he's, he's admitting that his theory has to have death, lots of die-offs, in order to get life to move in a, in a, uh, in a trajectory. And uh, so that's, that's where death plays a critical role. According to Darwin, who else has something to say about this? Role of death. Yeah, absolutely. It's a death-driven theory. I mean, that's, that's one of Darwin's main supposed mechanisms in his whole uh, paradigm. This is from a paper called The Power of This View of Life, in, published in Natural History magazine by Stephen J. Gould. And uh, Gould said this, and by the way, Gould is, is one of the leading, uh, was one of the leading evolutionists of the modern, or our modern era and probably one of the most honest and the most astute um, as well. And he, he said this, moreover, natural selection expressed in, appro in inappropriate human terms is a remarkably inefficient, even cruel process. Selection carves adaptation by eliminating masses of the less fit. So and right there's, there, there's the death. There's the death-driven component, absolutely. Imposing hecatombs of death, which just means mass, massive amounts of death, as preconditions for limited increments of change. Natural selection is a theory of trial and error, externalism. There's the externalism that we've been talking about. Organisms propose via their storehouse of variation and environments, dispose of nearly all not an efficient and human goal-oriented internalism, which would be the fast and lovely, but nature does not know the way. So he's basically saying Darwin's whole method of, of selecting, if you will, is, is death. Is death. It's a death-driven uh, scenario, and lots of people like to say, oh, no, that's really not what's going on, but, but really that's, that's the undergirding principle of it. Well, it ties it back to that survival of the fittest idea. Exactly. You know, and everybody understands that. Everybody kind of gets the idea that, like, okay, there's you know a herd of animals out there, and one of them's sick, and so that's the you know that's the animal that's most likely going to be lagging behind the herd, and will be you know, either die and get eaten or scavenged or something like that, and gets culled from the herd, so to speak. Well, everybody it's the reality there. That. I mean, the, it, you know, if the animal gets a pathogen, it gets sick which is probably most often the case, it's, it's not that this <laughs> animal was disadvantaged somehow. I mean, it could have been, but generally speaking, there was something else going on. It's, it's and so there's really no, no power even behind this death-driven scenario anyways. Well, that, then that animal dies. Exactly. And so how is that changing anything? Right. You know, how is that other than you have maybe a, a more healthy population, but you don't have anything changing to anything else? You know, from a from a genetic standpoint, the when the modern synthesis, which was rolling in Darwin's selectionism with, you know, the understanding of genetics came in at the earlier part of the last century, this also became even more important as they understood the whole idea of genes, because they they want to have a direction to evolutionary change. And if if all of the organisms are allowed to reproduce, then you never shift the gene frequencies in the population one way or the other. If, if every organism can reproduce, if every organism can have offspring, um, then you don't, you don't get any type of change. But if those organisms die, then they do not reproduce. 
And in their view, their genetic contribution is now eliminated from the gene pool, which I was taught, which I was what I was taught as a kid. We didn't want to pollute the gene pool. And we didn't want to take down the gene pool and things like that. And so from just a pragmatic standpoint in terms of their theory, you have to get the so-called less fit genes out of the gene pool so only those with the correct genes can reproduce. So in many ways, this massive amount of death, which Darwin didn't know anything about the genes at the time, but he knew that it was going to be built on extinction, one extinction in this war for survival on the backs of the other. Is, um, it, he knew that was important, and with the advent of genetics, then they started to quantify, in terms of population genetics, why this had to happen on that. But you know the, what uh, Dr. Clary was going to read there is the whole idea of, of advancement being built on the backs mm -hmm. of everything else. Uh, I don't want to get too off, off topic here, but this idea of mass death, mass extinction, um, in, in some ways I think that might go mm -hmm. to the fossil record. Mm -hmm. So do you want to explain, well, uh, Dr. Clary, what's going on there? Because some people may be saying, yeah, but what about all these fossils, it looks like mass extinction, mass death. Well, in many places in you know, the rock record, we see what many things disappear suddenly. Right. So you have the record, we believe, of the flood, and you go along at certain levels, and there's many things will disappear at a certain level. And the evolutionary scientists will say, well, that was a big extinction event. They'll try to blame it on like an asteroid or some major impact. You know, they, they're kind of sometimes grasp at straws trying to figure out what to blame it on or what to explain it by, but they, in their worldview, they see these things, you know, going through changing, going through changing through millions and millions of years, and then suddenly there's these events, about five major ones, that they've identified in kind of the rock record that we consider mostly the flood rocks, where you see these major shifts, and, and those are, in their mind, that's where animals disappear suddenly, and then they use the metaphors of saying these animals then can fill in the niche with these other animals where they disappeared. They well, it's really take going over. on there in, in the yeah, rock they, record to, from the biblical well, creationist I'll, perspective. I'll get to that, but, yeah. what, but what they say is, of course, these animals now, when you look, the dinosaurs disappear. So you have the KET or the KEPG, it's called now, the end of the Cretaceous. And so that ends the Mesozoic you know, era in their mind. And then mammals then were able to flourish because the dinosaurs were gone, that sort of idea. And so they have all these stories that they'll tell about why Things became, you know, why do we see different changes in the rock record? But in a flood story, I guess, I guess the way we would look at it, the way our interpretation is that this is the record of the flood, and we see a progressive flood. We see rocks that are being buried early on. They're all marine fossils mostly, or just buried in the shallow marine areas. And as the flood pushed higher and higher due to, we believe, catastrophic plate tectonic activity and making more seafloor, you push the the waves higher and higher and higher, and over 150 days, of course, the water rose higher until it went over the top. And so that's what the Bible tells us, and that's what we see in the rock record. We see things suddenly disappearing because suddenly you're destroying complete ecosystems and environments. And buried in mass. And they're gone. So all right. the dinosaurs and their whole ecosystem, the plants they were with, all buried in mass, and then you go on to the next ecosystem. So they're not really extinction events at all. Right. They're just the last record of those animals in the rock record, or those plants in the rock record. And in many cases, because of these major ecological zones that were inundated progressively, we see major shifts in the rock types or that contain the fossils in those rocks from one type to another. So we see marine fossils mostly, then we see mixing of land and marine and swampy animals and plants that go in those swampy areas. And we see higher ground areas, mostly these larger mammals that we're more familiar with, like camels and horses in the rocks on top of the dinosaurs because those are the, probably the highest elevations in the pre-flood world. And so we see this progressive flood record. It's not a record of evolution at all. Right. But, but they have to tie it to that. They have to tie it to this struggle for existence throughout millions and millions of years of time. Well, Darwin himself, God out. yeah, Darwin himself was, was heavily influenced mm -hmm. by Charles Lyell, uh, who was an early geologist. And pushing deep time. And pushing, pushing deep, deep time, time. and these, probably these mass extinctions as well. So, so. so really, there are no mass extinctions. Right. It's just the, that's the last record it's of, the global of, flood, of a basically. lot of animals right. that, you know, sometimes there's a lot of things that disappear at that same level, but that's because you are destroying a complete ecosystem and move on to the next one. That's the way we envision it. It would have been one, except for the mm -hmm. ark. Mm -hmm. 
it would have been one mass, one mass extinction, mm -hmm. exactly. not multiple extinctions, right. except for the yeah. ark. Exactly. Yeah, that's well said. And I'm glad you guys brought this up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so thanks for that. For that that uh, diversion? <laughs> <laughs> no, because here's the thing. Dr. Clary, if what you're saying is true, the flood formed all these rock layers with all, that means there goes the millions of years mm -hmm. that, that natural selection needs in order to have crafted, you know, fish into philosophers, so to speak. Uh, bye bye deep time. <laughs> you know, if the flood explains it, then, I mean, for some of us, I think the question, it's answered. It's like, well, there's no natural, there's no natural process to explain creature adaptations or creature features, period, because you don't have enough time for nature to do diddly squat. You've got to, you've got to have these creatures suddenly appearing and it, and it fits the creation model as it's described in the Bible. This is a radical new way to think for some of us. Uh, it's, it's, you, know, you can't test fish to amphibians or you know, any major change that the evolutionary scientists put forth and say, well, this happened, this happened. And you look in the rock record, you don't see it. You don't see those transitional fossils. You don't see things changing. You just see new things suddenly showing up, fully formed, and ready to go. New types of dinosaurs, new types of fish, new types of clams. Everything just shows up suddenly formed, ready to go. Trilobites with eyes, they just show up suddenly. Everything all happens in, at the basal layers that we think where the flood begins. Suddenly you get rocks filled with fossils all the way up. And of course, the Bible tells us the flood lasted about a year and rose 150 days. So we see the, almost a complete stratigraphic record that contains fossils as all happening in that one year of the flood. Well, there was a lot of death, the, a, lot of, a lot of dying creatures, but they were dying in the flood. So it's, 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 if they were dying in the flood, that's in, let's, like you just said, one year's worth of death. But, natural, but Darwin's conception here that we just were talking about um, it needs eons of continuous death to continuously, uh, year by year, for who knows how many countless years, to remove the unfit, remove the unfit. And, well, if, if, if you don't have the years, uh, you know, then, then you, don't have, you don't have a workable theory on this. And you don't have the transitional fossils. Because you need, you need all those in, in kinds in between this and in between this and in between this. So what we see in the rock record really confirms the flood account. The, the flood really did happen. There really was a global flood. There really was a progressive flood that put all these animals out there in perfect order on every continent, pretty much in the same order. Wow. So, so it's a global pattern, you see. That's remarkable. You mentioned this, this scenario, and when you said it, it reminded me of how I used to believe it. I used to believe it when my teachers told me or when I, when I watched it on PBS documentaries where at the end of this extinction event in the rock record, all these die-offs occurred and that, that leaves a bunch of open niches, that, be, you know, that leaves a bunch, of, a bunch of plants ready to be eaten and so suddenly you've got the emergence, there's another magic word, of, of this new set of creatures that adapted, another magic, magic word, uh, and evolved, magic word, to fill in these new niches, and now they're able to to live in these places and eat these different, and it's and they're speaking. And I used to go, okay, that makes sense. You know, you open up a new door, and evolution's going to enter that door. Um, but the but but the whole time I was not thinking about the <laughs> fact that that concept has the need, just the raw bare need solving its own problem as though let's say you have a need i need to let's say i'm an animal i need to fit that niche but the animal doesn't know that uh, in, in other words it's like it's like we're speaking when we talk about when i used to talk about natural selection as though it was really happening uh, I, w I was speaking in terms of well there's a need so obviously th the need out there the the conditions out there, they crafted their own solutions to those problems. But that's just nonsense uh, to, to have been thinking that way. Well, that reminds me of a story. I don't want to get off too off topic, but this one's kind of quick. It kind of goes along with that. It always takes an engineer to, to, to craft solutions to these. You have to engineer it. So what's your story? Well, Dr. Bob Bakker, 
famous paleontologist, dinosaur discoverer, wrote the Dinosaur Heresies. He used to, we used to sell DVDs in a class I used to teach, it, and he used to talk about how he believed that dinosaurs caused plants to evolve because they ate all the non-flowering plants so quickly that the plants had to somehow evolve through these external pressures into flowering plants so they could grow faster and, and reproduce faster and so they wouldn't go extinct. So, so, he, so he kind of put the onus on the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs forced plants to evolve. So the need to, the need, are you saying that, the, that he taught that the need to reproduce faster was all that we needed, was the need? <laughs> Apparently and so. suddenly, the need met itself by engineering its own solution. But needs need. never engineer anything. So you have to have an engineer, an actual divine engineer, to make those flowering plants in the first place. That's a view that I, that I now ascribe to. It seems to fit. Speaking of that divine engineer, we just talked about death and how death is really rolled up into Darwin's original conception of natural selection. How well does that death comport with God, with our theology of God? the goodness of God, who he is. Is, is natural selection a God-ordained process? Uh, Stephen Gould, again, we, we, we go back to him a lot because he's thought about this a lot, and he's going he's gonna to draw out a stark contrast between natural selection and God. He says this, the radicalism of natural selection lies in its power to dethrone, here, here we go, here, here comes the dethroning, to dethrone some of the deepest and most traditional comforts of Western thought, particularly the notion that nature's benevolence, order, and good design, with humans at a sensible summit of power and excellence, prove the existence of an omnipotent and benevolent creator who loves us most of all. To these beliefs, Darwinian natural selection presents the most contrary position imaginable. So, if you were to ask Gould, is natural selection a God-ordained process? He, right now, he's saying, not only is it not God-ordained, there is no God in it. Anyway, to these beliefs, um, Darwinian natural selection presents the most contrary position uh, imaginable. Only one causal force produces evolutionary change in Darwin's world. That is the unconscious struggle among individual organisms to promote their own personal reproductive Success. Nothing else. N nothing else is needed. This unconscious struggle among individual organisms to, to promote their own personal reproductive success. Is that all we need? Really? I'll, I'll reproduce the next person. Yeah, but it's really a perversion. And um, I, I mean, I is think, that a good I, substitute I, God and yeah, a struggle for? No, it's not. We should be finding this as as Christians revolting. Because, you know, the Bible says that God has not left himself without witness. And the witness was not only that he was or that he exists. It says you can determine some of his nature. And biologists prior to Darwin, not only, not only could they see that God was, they could determine things about his nature. And as, as, as Gould was trying to point out there that they saw benevolence. That means kindness or goodness. Uh, kindness or goodness. They saw omnipotence. They saw Power. characteristics yeah. of God in the natural world. And in fact, there was even a debate amongst... Through that which he has made. Through that which he's made amongst British and American naturalists where the Americans basically saw the power of God through the complexity of creatures and British naturalists saw the benevolence of God, the goodness of God through how everything seemed to fit together and work together you know, despite the fact that organisms die so well. And what Darwin is saying here is, to that view of that you, what you can determine about God by looking at nature, Darwinian natural selection, he doesn't say evolution. He says it's Darwinian natural selection presents the most contrary view imaginable, absolutely imaginable, because he's, he recognizes it is a death-driven view, and not only that, Instead of, being, instead of benevolence being there, it is just the outworking of each individual's own selfish ends, out-competing the other, stepping on somebody else. You know, we, we didn't read this quote by Stephen Jobs. It's right before he died, and he kind of adds to this where he says, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. 
And you can almost submit it right here, right with Gould, because he's saying to, the, to your concept of who God is, natural selection is the absolute opposite of that. And so how can we even make peace with it? How can we come up with any definition which ignores all this history, which ignores what Darwin said, which ignores what everybody has said about it, and say, well, natural selection is just differential reproduction, and, and natural selection was even in the Garden of Eden at one time. How do, you, how do you ignore everything that's ever been written about natural selection? I guess unless you can invent your own definition, which we found out in the last episode, you can. You can make it up. Um, but I'm saying in, in, in terms of being intellectually honest, how can you ignore all of that stuff and just say, oh, I'm just going to weld and I'm going to marry natural selection to this creationist view, you know who would be laughing from his grave? Stephen Jay Gould and Stephen Jobs. They're laughing from their grave. There's, how could you even put these two together? They just don't fit. They don't fit. They don't fit. In fact, natural selection was, in, was designed and invented to remove God as a substitute uh, a creator, and we'll get to some of those quotes next. Is natural selection a God-ordained process? Does anyone else other than Stephen Jay Gould have something to say about that? Well, not only that, I'm going to read uh, a quote here uh, from Carl Pearson, but does it really lead to, to anything good? Well, natural selection, that whole idea of Darwin and Malthus, um, basically paved the way for what we now call the, the eugenics movement uh, in the late 1800s, early uh, 1900s, and in fact, that was what Hitler used as his primary uh, philosophy for his concentration camps to exterminate uh, the Jews and, and other people groups, yeah, as well as other other despotic people. They they basically based this death-driven uh, concept. Uh, on it, it, they 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 based their whole philosophy and outlook and, and their entire political system where they they exercise the power of, of oppressive go oppressive governments and states to literally murder millions of people, and so I, I just want to read this this enlightening passage here from Carl Pearson, and he said that is I think the ever present fear which the scientific mind recognizes civilized man has largely destroyed crude natural selection. In my own mind and in a growing number of other minds, civilization will end unless civilization can find a method of doing for itself what natural selection did for man during his ascent. In other words, he's wanting to take natural selection into his own hands and eliminate humans, ensuring that he shall breed only from his best. And of course, that was the Nazi uh, philosophy there. The study of how it is po how it is possible forms the subject matter of what we now term the science of eugenics. We have to replace the ruthless action of natural selection by reasoned conduct in civilized man. And I actually use a quote uh, from Stephen Jay Gould uh, in some talks that I give, where Gould actually says that that this whole idea of, uh, of racism, even though it did exist before Darwin, it, it increased by orders of magnitude after Darwin. And even Stephen Jay Gould, we've been quoting him a lot, uh, even he recognized that, that after the time of Darwin, this death-driven concept resulted literally in the murder of millions of humans really all over the globe. And not just the Nazi regime, but regime, but others. Communism, especially. Exactly. Well, even in the United States, mm -hmm. over 30 states mm -hmm. passed these eugenic laws, and the the Nazi law was patterned after the law from Indiana and Virginia. They took our laws and and transcribed them into German and passed those laws. Most people don't realize that that 30 states had this forced sterilization, mm -hmm. forced abortions, and over. Over 70,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized in this country, and we don't talk about it. And it's almost this contradiction of thinking, as he says, we have to replace the ruthless action of natural selection with the reason conduct of civilized man. It, it, there's, it, there's just, it just makes no sense. 
And I'm, I just want to point out, he's, he's not saying we need to replace the ruthless action of evolution. He boils it down to what it really was, natural selection. So did God ordain natural selection? Well, if he did, it would make God out to be pretty ruthless. Yeah. And that's not the God of the Bible. That's not it. If, if it's God's, you know, some places say that natural selection is a God-ordained process by which he, he preserves the gene pool of populations by weeding out and getting rid of and culling mm -hmm. the unfit so that it stays preserved for the fit. And I hate to say that even this ministry used to say something like this at one time. It's a, it was a conservative process, not a creative process. We came up with these little slogans where we, where we kind of accommodated natural selection. It's, it's conserving the population from being dragged down. The problem is, is when a young person with a genetic disease dies before they can reproduce or, or whatever, that's not a gift to all of us. That's a tragedy. Is natural selection tangible and measurable? Is it tangible? It can we touch it? Can we, can we measure it? Is it in the papers? Now, I read a recent creation article that said, creation-based article that said natural selection is obvious, happens all the time. It's, in, it's, it's even described in science papers and it gave a reference. And I went and looked up the reference and the reference was a technical journal article that talked about natural selection. But the, the article assumed natural selection throughout. It never demonstrated it. And so is it tangible? Is it measurable? Well, let's, let's look at some of today's uh, thinkers who are analyzing and critiquing Darwinian thought um, to see what they have to say about this, in, including Neil Thomas way back in uh, a few months ago in December 2021. Darwin's way of thinking any selection must occur without purpose in or intent. Apparently passing over in tactful silence the blinding logical contradiction of selection without intent inherent in Darwin's thinking. It is hardly surprising that in a recent paper to pin down the precise phenomenological status of natural selection, David Brown concluded that the term it's more of a fuzzy imaginative con construct than a phenomenon we might locate in the natural world itself. The term lacks an adequately defined referent because such a referent has never been empirically located in nature, making the term something of a phantom without material existence. Wow. So his answer to the question, is natural selection um, tangible and measurable, is... Uh, we're looking, 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 but the best we can do is assume that it explains what we already see. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's a phantom. They're saying this, not us. Yeah, he goes on to add in, a, in another article this year, just a few months ago this year, and, and really aptly titled, as Dr. Tompkins pointed out, the titles are important, Why Words Matter, Sense and Nonsense in Science, also posted on Evolution News. He, he is a very thoughtful man and he's a linguist and he looks at the words and he says it is, it is for people in all ages and cultures to create neologisms, those are new words, or as he says in the next phrase, or ad hoc linguistic formulations for a whole variety of vague ideas and fancies. In fact, it seems all too easy to fashion words to cover any number of purely abstract, at times even chimerical notions. He has a, he has a flair for words here. <laughs> So, so, well, let's... Let's parse it out. What does that mean? Yeah, okay. It means things that are, exist only in your mind and, um, and are not really there. As he said in the previous quote, there's no reference. You can't reach out and touch it. You can't put your hands on it. They're abstract things. So it's a phantom, like you said. It's like a phantom. So, so a chimera is like a half horse, half human? Yep. And, and one, you have one entity glommed onto another with no rational way to actually do that. To bring those so, to balance. So he's saying even, even wackadoodle notions. Yeah, wackadoodle. Mm. I, I think that's, that's he could have put that in. Right? Maybe that's, I should be the next linguist. That's right. Maybe, uh, that's it to define it. Yeah, yeah, it's anyway, the more convincingly for the uncritical, if one chooses to append the honorific title of science. Many terms we use in everyday life are and, in, and are widely acknowledged to be notional rather than factual. What are some of these terms he calls airy nothings? 
These are factually baseless terms existing on paper, but without any proper referent in the real world because no such referent exists. In a similar vein, one might, with Charles Darwin, theorize that the development of the biosphere was simply down to that empirically untested subvariant of chance he chose to term natural selection. Since no empirical evidence exists for any and all of the above conjectures of which he's rolling in natural selection, they must inevitably remain terms without reference or simply empty signifiers. Well, so these guys are saying it's a phantom, uh, and, and he says it's empty. Um, so in other words, we're using the term natural selection, but it, it's, it's actually a metaphor. A metaphor refers to, that refers to human selectors, but it's not actually human selectors because there's no actual mind. And so what actually is it? Oh, it's a phantom. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of the picture that I'm that I'm building from from this. Yeah, mystical mental construct. But what about that lizard study? Years ago, we were talking about a lizard study. And Dr. Tim, sorry, we're going to talk about lizards for a minute. It has nothing to do with rocks. Just Is it for a fossil minute, so. lizard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was an anole, and they stuck an anole on an island uh, for years to see multiple generations of this of this lizard, and um, to see how you know, what, what the conditions on that island would select in the, in the anole. Dr. G, do you remember that study and the result we of We actually it? had several of these lizard studies, so I, I'm okay. on, uh, let me see if I pull out the one that, see if I can get your notional thought in mind oh, yeah. here as well. It was at the one on the Greek islands where the lizards had basically a, they, they had an insect-based diet and they transferred them to another diet and ended up with a primarily plant-based diet. And in just a several decades, they came back and they examined these lizards and they had developed a cecum, a part in their colon which enabled them to digest plant materials and suddenly lizards which did not have a cecum suddenly had a cecum and would enable them to live on this island. Did That's they call it natural they, selection? Yes, they, they would, but uh, in order to actually have called it natural selection according to Darwin's theory, he would have had to have documented that there was a slow development of the cecum, the ones without it were selected against, and the ones with it were highly favored, generation after generation, of which there wasn't a whole lot, in these li and it wasn't over thousands of years by any means, um, in order to develop the cecum. That would be one way of interpreting it. Well, okay, pause. What's yeah. a cecum? It's a, it's a little pouch, which a lot of animals have, you know, on their, really at the junction many times of the small intestine and large intestine, and it allows for plant material to be located there during the digestive process. It allows for bacteria to break it down and allows for the nutritional aspects of that plant material to be absorbed by the creature um, so that they can eat a plant-based diet and actually thrive on it. Is, so, that, is that the so, study you were thinking of? So, no, but this is interesting. <laughs> so if I become vegetarian, maybe my kids will develop cecums. That would be fun. Uh, well, anyway, so it helps. It helps. It helped those lizards. And so you said that's one way of looking at it. The other way would be is that um, the ability for these lizards to adjust, and in this case, rapidly adjust from one type of diet to another type of diet, is really what it was, is actually an innate process. And these lizards somehow have a way, and this is why we get derailed by going down the selectionist route, is we don't actually start looking for how this is happening. Maybe they can detect this change in diet. Maybe they're not consciously detecting it, but maybe sensors or something in their body can detect it, and it sets them down the path and at the developmental stage to develop a cecum. All we know is they didn't have it, and now they have it in less than 40 years, and they're eating a plant-based diet. And this is why Darwin really is, selectionism is really an interpretive framework. They interpret it as in terms of survival of the fittest, some selected out, some favored, some worked on, some acted on, and all those things. And if you went from an internalist account, you would initially go down and be suspicious that there's something within the lizards themselves which enables them to rapidly change to these populations. That's why this is kind of important from a scientific view, is it, it, shut, it shuns you down two different paths. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier, you don't even have the right framework of mind. Because, even, because in that study, you'd just be thinking in terms of the diet, the diet. It's the plants that are, that are the, the condition that are, that are making these changes. In the, 
And, it's, and, and if, you, right. if, that's, if, that's what, if that's all you're able to think about and all you want to talk about, then you won't even look, it, it, right. it, look inside the lizard to see if it has, you know, like the Swiss Army knife where it can deploy a cecum or fold, fold away the cecum or deploy these different uh, attributes these exactly. uh, to, 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 to fit and fill various environments. Like if it's that. As something we read a little bit earlier, it's, it's as Darwin saw it, as a hit and miss type of externalism. He doesn't see it as a design process. It's trial and error, hit and miss, of which the ones that miss die. He also insisted on short and sure but slow steps. And you get that lizard, 40 years, just a handful of generations. That's not short. That's not slow. He insisted on slow, but what, we're, what biologists are noticing are, are lots and more of, of, of examples of rapid, rapidly deployable adaptations, even across generations. So why... Working back, I didn't anticipate this when we first started these podcasts, but every episode we have landed on, wow, this really seems like a substitute creator. Natural selection, it's a swapping out of something metaphorical, a metaphor, swapping out you know, what God did for a metaphor. Um, and we have other folks who, who we want to we bring out their words on this can we treat, do they treat, do they talk about natural selection as a substitute God? So we've been talking about it, but we already are predisposed to, you know, to critique Darwin's theories here. But what about those who, like Jerry Coyne, atheist, Darwinist atheist, um, he, he said this regarding substitute God. Everywhere we look in nature, we see animals that seem beautifully designed to fit their environment. It's no surprise that early naturalists believed that animals were the product of celestial design created by God to do their jobs. By the way, also late naturalists, like us in this room right now, we also have gone back to believing in this because we have an actual designer, not some vague metaphor. We have an actual creator who actually has power and intent and a mind and capability and not just a metaphor, a, a, a phantom, as one said just a minute ago. Darwin dispelled this notion in the origin. In a single chapter, he completely replaced centuries of certainty about divine design with the notion of a mindless, materialistic process, natural selection, that could accomplish the same result. Wow, talk about a substitute God. That was, that's, what, that's the effect of natural selection, at least on this atheist's um, worldview. Yeah, I want to read something here from Daniel Dennett. Uh, he was a science writer at the New York Times, and in 2005 he said this, and this is a, a fairly short, short excerpt here. The fundamental scientific idea of evolution by natural selection is not just mind-boggling. Natural selection, by executing God's traditional task of designing and creating all creatures, great and small, also seems to deny one of the best reasons we have for believing in God. The idea that natural selection has the power to generate such sophisticated designs is deeply counterintuitive. This reminds me of a study uh, that I believe psychologists did several years ago where they, they proved that children, when they see something like a rabbit, or, or some creature of some sort, they intuitively know that that was created by something. It just didn't happen randomly. And or, it or, or it, naturally. It, exactly, and it literally takes years and years of, <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and use the term brainwashing these children to get them to think otherwise, to get that out of their system and so it, is, it really is counterintuitive to say, look, that a mindless uh, a process like natural selection created all this uh, diversity in this life and this, this complexity that we see at literally every level of life. Right. Well, John Reese said this, what is most surprising about the historical path that led to the mess we are currently in is that Darwin's natural selection stood in for the creationist designer rather than... Rather than the anti-teleologist chance subject to the conditions for existence. 
That's a big word. That's yeah, a that's a good word. one. That means, that means anti-design. And I'll just wrap up just for the sake of time with these last two. Edward O. Wilson, he just passed away recently. He was a famous Harvard biologist, did a lot of study on ants. On human nature, said, if humankind evolved by Darwinian natural selection, genetic chance, and environmental necessity, not God, made the species. And then Stuart A. Kaufman, um, he wraps up by saying, biologists now tend to believe profoundly that natural selection is the invisible hand that crafts well-wrought forms. It may be an overstatement to claim that biologists view selection as the sole source of order in biology, but not by much. If current biology has a central canon, you've now heard it. The central canon is you don't need a god because we have natural selection. And so we ask the question, um, is natural selection treated as a substitute god? And these guys would all say, yes. Yes, we've swapped out. There's no more need for God because natural selection has taken his place. So why would we hitch our wagons to this, um, to this substitute God? And along those lines, now God doesn't show up necessarily physically, but he leaves evidence of his handiwork. That's how we know that he is and a little bit about who he is. And then when we read the scripture, we know more about who he is and who we are and how we can relate to him. Um, but this does require faith. You, you, you have to reckon as true that which God says. And so when Darwinists use the phrase natural selection, are they reckoning as true that which Darwin said? In other words, are they exercising a faith of sorts in the words, not of the Bible, but in the words of Darwin and his followers? Well, we have some explicit language on this, uh, this question of faith. One source, says Michael Hodge, uh, of trouble was that Darwin liked the term natural selection because it could be, quote, used as a substantive governing a verb. Okay, but such uses appeared to reify or even to deify natural selection as an agent. Uh, could someone help me with substantive governing a verb? Yeah, that was actually a quote from Darwin himself. Um, Darwin liked it because it could be used as a substantive governing verb. And I'll have to confess, when I first read that, I was like, what in the world are they talking about right there? Look this one up. So I had to look it up. And a substantive is when you treat something intangible, a concept in your mind, as if it is a tangible thing, as if it is a, a real thing. Mm. So I can govern verbs. I can act. I can work on, I can weed, mm. but my thoughts in and of themselves can't. But when I treat my thoughts as, as something that can govern a verb, a concept, as if, as if it's a real thing that can govern verbs, that is what Darwin liked. He can treat his concept as if it can govern verbs. And, and, and when you think about it, this is what Michael Hodge, he's an historian of, of science, he says, this seemed to even reify, if not deify, natural selection as an agent. And when you think about it, when you go back through in the entire biblical time, you know, and they had all of these idols, they had a grove, they had, they had Moloch, they had Baal, they had all these things. Even today, there's cultures that have, it, that have idols. And exactly. So what do we, it's kind of hard for us to identify with because we don't, some we of don't us do Americans that. don't necessarily have a shrine that we... So a lot of do us do, but, but a lot of them do. Uh, but so, some do, and, and in other cultures have even more. Exactly. And what do we do when we, when we pay homage to these little G gods? We, we, we believe, we believe in our mind, it can do something. It can do something. It can do something. It can something. help make me healthy. It can select my mate. It can, whatever it is, so the idolatry isn't in the little shrine. The idolatry is in your mind. It's what you believe it can do for you. It's not really in the little idol or the little trinket, the rabbit's foot. It's in what you think the rabbit's foot can do because you think it can govern a verb. And so Hodge here, when he talks about this idea of it deifying nature, he's really telling us what the essence of idolatry is. It's what we think it can do. In other words, I think that rabbit's foot 
can govern a verb. Well, you know, even evolutionists, you know, recognize that natural selection, that whole idea is, is something you have to put your faith in like a God, just like we put our faith in the, in the Creator, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to read an excerpt from an article that was written by an evolutionist uh, by MIT Press, Evolution by Natural Experiment. He said this, it's Robert uh, G.B. Reed. Little wonder creationists find it, which is selectionism, such an easy mark. But they and selectionists have this in common. Faith in the eff efficacy of a creative mechanism that has no material reality. So he admitted that natural selection has no material reality, yet evolutionists put their faith in that, and it becomes their god, really. I mean, that's the bottom line, right, in, in a sense, because it can do all sorts of amazing things and create this world and all the creatures in it. So I don't think it's a stretch to, to well, say yeah. that, because even evolutionists recognize the... The, the truth of that whole paradigm. Well, at well, least this one does, and, and the few who think about it do. Yeah, if they right. really seriously think about, about what they're putting well, they, their faith in. They go all the way back, you know, to, to stellar evolution. You know, they go back to, they push it all the way back, even before there was life. You know, the, the universe can create itself. The right conditions, somehow or other, the universe created itself. And created well, who the was Earth the astronomer that said, praise hydrogen and not uh, Jesus Christ? Uh, I don't remember who that was. Anyways, there's some famous astronomer that, that that basically said that. Not not so not so far in the uh, the distant past. Yeah. It might have been Sean Carroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Lawrence, might have been Krauss. Krauss. Lawrence, 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 Lawrence Krauss. Krauss. Yeah. Yes, yes. Krauss, yeah. yeah, he was talking about yeah. how all the elements that make us came out of stars that exploded. Mm -hmm. So it was basically stars that died for you. So under the right conditions, that's why they believe they project that you can find life on Mars, you can find life on these different places that have conditions similar to what we have here on Earth that God created for us. You know, the perfect location, the perfect everything. They even say, well, it just sort of happened that way. But th that's why they project again in their minds that you can get life anywhere right. under the right conditions because nature somehow magically is, is creating life. Well, it's magic to think that conditions can make anything, <laughs> even life. We have the conditions that sustain life here, but none of them make any. We don't see life emerging here today. Uh, it, do they use faith? Is faith involved in natural selection and the way some of these guys talk about it? Well, there's a quote from Neil Thomas in uh, 2021. He said, A little wonder that Bishop Samuel Wilberforce commented that Darwin was implicitly ascribing to nature the same ontological status as theists customarily ascribed to God. Darwin's tacit raising of external nature to crypto-divine status was, concluded Wilberforce, just as much an article of faith as any of the more conventional forms of theistic belief. Boom, there's faith again, and they're admitting it. Lifting up that carpet and going, what's, what's, under, this? <laughs> what's under this veneer that we're all pretending and, you know, is responsible for the construction of, of, of all these creatures? Well, we just believe that it's doing it. Actually, Jerry Fodor, with the, next, with the next thing we'd like to read, he's lifting the carpet. This man is, a, is an avowed atheist. He was. He's, he's passed away now. Um, and and, and he, he, he wanted his atheism straight, as we mentioned. <laughs> and he says this, Familiar claims to the contrary, notwithstanding, Darwin didn't manage to get mental causes out of his account of how evolution works. He just hid them in the unexamined analogy between selection by breeding and natural selection. He's kind of wrapping a lot of things we've discussed all up. Mm -hmm. We can claim something that Darwinists cannot. This was Jerry Fodor and his partner, Massimo Piatelli Parmarini. There is no ghost in our machine, neither God, nor Mother Nature, nor selfish genes, nor world spirit, nor free floating intentions, and there is no phantom breeder either. What breeds the ghost in Darwinism, oh, that's the black box that you mentioned earlier, this, the, the magical hand, is its covert appeal to intentional biological explanations. Darwin pointed the direction to a thoroughly naturalistic, indeed thoroughly atheistic theory of phenotypic or trait formation 
but he didn't see how to get the whole way there. He killed off God, if you like, but Mother Nature and other pseudo-agents, and he's talking about selection here, got away scot-free. We think it's time to get rid of them too. But the crazy thing, so he's admitting this is faith-based. Right. This is, these are replacement God. This natural selection is a replacement God. And, and, and we want it to be totally mechanistic in all of its explanations. So, there, so what's his solution? The, the, it, ironically, the solution is let's look at the creature and what it's deploying. Right. But you can't get that using any mechanistic means. You have right. to get that with an actual creator. Uh, anyway, so that's the, I find that ironic. But he killed off God. He admits it right there. Right. Darwin, he admits it. Darwin. Yeah, Darwin killed off God with natural selection. And so, so this goes back to our earlier question, you know, about natural selection. Is, is it compatible with God? Well, it's the exact antithesis. Right. In, in a lot of ways. But all he did was replace it with Mother Nature. That's right. That's why he That's says he, really did. Some he, he didn't Nature. get yeah. mental causes out of his account because he just hit them in his unexamined analogy. There's, there's still this pseudo-mental cause permeating through Darwinism. It's, it's the selective ability of nature. And what we want to do in this discussion is to examine the analogy. And we've looked at that, and we, and we basically have let, uh, let the enemy, so to speak, the conceptual enemy, do the work for us. And they're the ones saying, we've looked at this analogy, and we've examined it, and we found it wanting. And uh, one of our last uh, quotes along these lines, uh, this is uh, Susan Mazur who's quoting the famous biologist Lynn Margulis back in 2009 as saying, Darwin was brilliant to make natural selection a sort of godlike term, an expression that could replace God who did it, created life forms. He made it easy for his contemporaries to think and verbalize Mr. Big Omnipotent God in the sky, picking out those he wants to keep. He has been conceived of as the natural selector. He throws the others away. Wow. An explicit admission of a replacement God, doing whatever we can to push God out of the picture. Along those lines, I want to read... One of my <laughs> favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes from an evolutionist that I think really sums everything up. And I remember when I when I saw this uh, on the internet shortly after it was posted, I thought, you know, this 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 really is is where it's at. And this guy, his name is Greg Groffin. Um, he is an evolutionist. Uh, he's a professor at a university in California, and the, the name of the article was, this is what caught my attention, Darwin was a punk. And uh, it was in Scientific American in October 1, 2010, and he said this, the trick is how do you talk about natural selection without implying the rigidity of law? We use it almost as an active participant, almost like a God. In fact, you could substitute the word God for natural selection in a lot of evolutionary writings. And you'd think you were listening to a theologian. It's a routine we know doesn't exist, but we teach it anyway. Genetic mutation and some active force choose the most favorable one. What more can you say? This yeah. is <laughs> <That's right. laughs> this is from an evolutionist, and uh, yeah, I, I, when I read this, I thought, yeah, that's that's exactly it. This guy hit the nail on the head. He wasn't some crazy creationist. He was a, uh, a he's actually a militant uh, anti-creationist, but but he called it for what it was. Yep, quite honest. Well, then I guess the question kind of comes up. Someone would say, well, yeah, these, these guys are just abusing the concept of natural selection. They're just, you know, they're just, they're just distorting it. It's, it. They're not using it like natural selection would have, was intended to be used. They're abusing it in some way. 
But from what we've discussed, is that true? Not at all. They're just substituting. They're just really substituting. Well, this guy recognized the same thing that I see when I read scientific paper after scientific paper. And, and all of these papers discover fantastic things about how the genome works or about how the cell works or whatever. But then they, they throw in this mystical term because they want to deny a creator. And, and they're doing exactly what Greg Graffin says that, said in this quote here. Yeah. So really, in, at the bottom line is, this is not an abuse of the concept of natural selection. This is what natural selection was intended to do all along. It was intended to function as a substitute agent. It was intended to be this personification of nature which can act on, work on, weed, call, do all of these kinds of things. It was intended to explain the design of life all along without appealing to an agent. And so what all of these gentlemen are saying, and they're very thoughtful, is not the misuse of natural selection, it is the use of natural selection. It is what it was intended to do all along. And so you really can't hide under the, under the carpet yourself and say, well, I want to hold the natural selection, but I just don't want to abuse it like the evolutionists do. They're not abusing it. They're using it for what Darwin invented the concept for right from the beginning. I would say that's a pretty, pretty convenient out yep. to say, oh, everyone who disagrees with me, they're just misusing it. <laughs> And that's a lot of people. That's, a, you know, generations of biologists who have supposedly been misusing it. Um, but it just, read, just read the origin. You see, it comes right out of the pages. It, it, you know, in fact, I have a friend of mine uh, who told me this story as he visited my office one day. He said, when I was 13 years old, I got curious about origins, and I read Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. I remember the day I finished the last page, and I walked into my living room, and I told my dad, who was sitting on the couch reading the newspaper, I said, Dad, I don't think there's a God. And he said, I became an atheist the, that day. Why did he become an atheist that day? Because he recognized that natural selection was a substitute God. You don't need a God in a world where natural selection can design everything. So God is a joke. So he said he spent his entire high school career scoffing at the Christians in the high school. And then he studied evolution because he wanted to know more about his faith when he got to college. And so he, he went to seminary, <laughs> evolutionary <laughs> seminary called any public school in the country. Uh, and, and, he, um, and, he, and he took a class on evolution where the, where the professor went from one subject to the next and said, basically, we have nothing here, we have nothing here, we have nothing here, but we have to believe in evolution. Last day of class, the professor said, we have to believe in evolution because the other option is a creator. And that's just not, this is not, we're just not going to go there. And then so he thought to himself, well, science is supposed to be about exploring all the options. So are there any other, is there any other way to think out there? So guess what he got a, a copy of? He got a copy of the seminal creationary, creationary work, uh, the Genesis Flood. And he said, I finished the Genesis Flood when I was 21 years old. And that convinced me that creation was true. And the flood explains the rock layers. And that left me no time for evolution. Mm -hmm. And so I became, and so then I started realizing I better read the Bible because if that's a true account of origins, maybe it's got something else to say. <laughs> and then he said he read the Bible and it talked about his own heart and how he's got this sinful tendency and he needs a savior. And he read, and he, and he came to Christ because of the words of scripture that he read. Uh, so that was a fantastic journey. The journey began with reading Darwin's book and the obvious conclusion, simple and straightforward, this is a substitute creator, substitute God. A series of yes and no questions, really quick, to summarize what we've talked about today. Um, was Darwin's metaphor seductive for many scientists? Does it remain seductive today? Yes, yes, of yes. course, yes, it was seductive. I was seduced, mm -hmm. and as I already confessed in the last episode, I was swindled. Mm -hmm. I was swindled and I was seduced and it doesn't just seduce uh, evolutionists, it seduces all selectionists. Mm -hmm. Very seductive, yes, so we've got to be on guard. Uh, was Darwin's conception of natural selection tied in tightly with lots and lots of death? Yes, yeah. again. Yes, again. Yeah. Uh, is, is natural selection God-friendly? 
is it friendly to the God of the Bible? <laughs> ask, your, ask your friend. The answer was no. Not at all. Uh, is natural selection mystical according to the admissions of those who have analyzed it and yet believe it? Believe yeah. it's some form of Darwinism. It was yes. this phantasm, this chimera, or whatever the word was that you made up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made it up? It yeah, that's a quote. It's a half horse. Totally mystical. Uh, in the, do Darwinists treat natural selection as a substitute creator? Oh, yes. Obviously. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and then finally, um, do scientists use faith when they, when they make assertions based on natural selection? Yes, again, overwhelming. They, they do, and they even admitted it. So these are all conclusions, these yes-no conclusions that came from their words. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us with more confidence than ever that pff, there's a real creator who's responsible for actually creating. And, you know, shame on us for getting hoodwinked and swindled and seduced by this empty metaphor of okay. natural selection. I've got one final question I want to ask the panel here. If all these biologists recognize that we just Darwin merely replaced God with you know nature, this fant fantasy, and whatever you want, whatever we called it, whatever the terms were, what do they have? If they recognize he just switched you know God from other nature, what's their solution? Do they have a better solution? Has anybody offered anything better other than going back to natural selection? Because they won't they won't no. put God in the picture. But yet they left themselves realizing, okay, we replaced God with another yep, yep. mystical substitute. Substitute, but yet that doesn't work either. Yeah, you're so asking really like a crystal ball type of question, and, and it's a great question because um, evolutionary theory is a theory in crisis, mm -hmm. and there's a whole wave of people who are looking to re-examine it because a lot of the evidence is not fitting this theory whatsoever. And in fact, ICR is now embarking down, which I believe is the right track of where we're needing to look, which is at the organisms in terms of that. However, and if I were to look in my crystal ball, mm -hmm. I would predict that evolutionary theory will never abandon natural selection altogether. Never. Even if the evidence isn't fitting it because it is this employment of the false metaphor, it is the projection of selective ability onto nature, which gives them the substitute God. That was, that was Darwin's coup de grace that he slipped in, and we've been swindled, and we've been seduced by it, and I don't think they'll ever get away from that because that is how he smuggles in substitute agency. So even if they have to modify the theory all around in many, many different ways, it's, they're ultimately going to go back to all of these things were at least at one time favored, selected on, acted on, and they'll go back to the mysticism. So if you want my prediction, they'll never, they'll never let this go. You'll, you'll get selection out of, out of the selectionist's hand when you pry it from their cold, dead fingers. It's like geologists with the deep time. The deep the same time. Thing. Same thing. No matter what the evidence shows, no matter how many proteins we find in dinosaur bones and things like Dr. Thomas's research, They'll still, well, we just don't understand how they were preserved, you know, but we know they're still millions and millions of years old. Yeah. It's just, they, again, it's prying it out of their, Cold because they refuse to see the evidence, that, you know, that, that we were created, that everything was created. That's right. That there was a flood. They refuse to even acknowledge these things. So they have to make up this mythical story right. that nature can somehow do everything, make the earth, make the solar system, make life. Yeah, so it's going to be everywhere. Right. Well, well, let's conclude with a message of hope. Yep. Yes, the vast majority will, will, will cling to those anti-God beliefs, but some may follow the evidence where it leads. Like my friend, whose yep. story I just told, uh, who found no evidence to support evolution, then he went and read creation materials and realized, ah, the Bible's right. He, he came out of that whole way of thinking, and he's been a Bible-believing scientist. Uh, nuclear medicine is his expert. Uh, expertise. There's ho there's people out there who are there's it may be one in a thousand in our culture. It may be one in a, in a vast majority of God deniers. But the evidence will 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 persuade some, and uh, we hope that it persuades more. Amen. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. If you found this helpful, make sure to like and subscribe. 
You can be notified of future episodes this way. We'll see you next time on creation.live.